I had ingested too much for my body to handle. Like, I thought I saw God. I was on the floor crying, just screaming, just hoping someone would help me because I didn't know what was happening. I didn't realize the gravity of the decision I had made and what I had just done. When you think of drug abuse, what comes to your mind? Like, when you think of the term opioid abuse, like, what do you think of? What's the first thing that comes to your head? Like, do you think of a dirty vagrant? Do you think of, like, a homeless person? Do you think of, like, a halfway shelter where people are kind of, you know, grizzled and shit like that? Do you think of a prison cell? What do you think of? Well, that is typically what most people think of, but what people don't understand about drug abuse is that it can happen in very suburban areas, and it can plague very ritzy type areas, too. It isn't just street crime. It isn't just scum of the earth. That isn't just where it happens. It can happen anywhere and that's the scariest part about it you can have like a suburban dad start drinking too much you can have a mom that gets on prescription pills that starts you know not acting like herself and it's a very scary subject to go into because not many people understand what happens when someone is chemically dependent upon a substance i know firsthand what that's like and i have done some very horrid things that i deeply regret and there isn't a day that goes by where i don't you know have trouble sleeping at night over the shit that I've done. I don't really have a good transition for this, so I guess I'll just start where it all began for me, I guess, where all the trauma began. My parents divorced when I was about two years old. I'm just gonna get that out of the way. And they have a very rocky relationship, to say the least. I remember when I was in kindergarten around the age of six, uh, whenever my dad would pick me up from school, he'd openly ask me, hey, Zach, you know how much of a bitch your mom is? Like, isn't she such a fucking bitch? Like, he would openly curse to me when I was a young fucking child. And and on top of this, my dad mostly, my mom would do this sometimes, they would make me feel like I would have to pick between the two, which was why I was going to therapy at the time as a child. And on top of that, I was getting my fucking shit kicked in at school. I think the first fight I ever actually got into was in kindergarten. Moving from then on, like, during my younger years, I did get into a significant amount of trouble. I don't remember too many of the details. What I do remember is that I went to the principal's office very often. I was on ADHD medications. I didn't get along with anyone else. I I was typically the bud of a lot of people's jokes. I was kind of an outcast in a way, and that wouldn't change for me throughout the duration of public school. It would kind of get worse from there. I guess things did get a little bit better when I went to a private school for a little bit, but that was very short-lived. What made me want to try drugs in the first place, like a lot of people, was probably, you know, peer pressure, wanting to fit in, because, like I said, throughout being in public school, I was very, you know, not a part of any group. I was very pushed off to the side, and I wanted that sense of inclusion. I wanted to feel like I was a part of something. I wanted to feel like I mattered. I had friends. So when I was about in eighth grade, I was a straight A student back then, and I was going through some other traumas relating to being taken advantage of sexually at the time. A friend came up to me, well, a friend, and he said, hey, Zach, you want to hang out? And I said yes immediately, because that was the first time anyone had really ever asked me to hang out after school. And he was with two other girls. He said, we're going to be smoking a bit of pot if that's okay with you. And at first I resisted because, you know, I had been brought up being told, like, don't do drugs. Drugs are bad. Don't do them. But I desperately wanted to be a part of what they were doing. I desperately wanted to be a part of them, in a sense, because I was a very lonely kid, and I was bullied quite often. So I ended up agreeing. In my hometown, there was this little restaurant that used to be there called Caro's. I don't know what it is now. I haven't been there in a couple years. I think it might be a cafe or something. But there are these massive tunnels behind them, like underground tunnels. And you have to hop a fence and you have to go down a ladder into these massive fucking tunnels. And there is just bat guano everywhere. There is graffiti everywhere. It smells awful. It's always like really wet down at the bottom. Like it's just a giant drainage system. And it's kind of funny because it's a very small town. And there's just this giant drainage system that you'd see in like LA or something. So I go down there and one of the girls takes out this like really schwap looking weed weed. Like, it looks like it's mostly oregano, honestly. And they were smoking it, and, uh, I was sitting there very awkwardly, and I didn't know how to connect with these people. It was the first time I had ever been invited to hang out with people outside of school, and I wanted so desperately to connect with them that I looked at my friend, and I told him, fuck it, give me a hit. And that was the first time I had ever tried pot. And from then on, I thought drugs were cool because that's what the cool kids were doing. And I didn't actively seek them. 
But from then on, if I was ever offered, I would accept. That's kind of where it started. When I started high school, I was telling myself, okay, I'm going to get grades like I did in eighth grade because that made my parents happy. It didn't make me happy. I didn't really feel anything when I was given this little diploma that said presidential honors for academic excellency. It was signed by Obama. It was a bunch of boring shit, but my parents were proud of me. I didn't really care, but I just wanted them to be happy with me just because I wanted to feel like I was accepted in some way. So I started off high school thinking, okay, I'm going to do the same thing I did in middle school. And that slowly dissolved because the bullying and exclusion kind of got worse. And I started looking more for just wanting to be a part of a group rather than my academics. I was looking for social acceptance as opposed to being able to get into a good school. I didn't care about that shit at that point. I think that was around the time when I started to pick up vaping, you know, like e-cigarettes, that gay shit. And my friend from earlier invited me to this youth group type thing. And it was a youth group, but it was really just an excuse for us to sneak off every Wednesday and go smoke a bowl with some other dude. And that's when I started to use pot more regularly. I used, started to use it like once a week. And this went on through, it was started freshman year, it went on through sophomore year. And I think after my sophomore year was when I started to seek it on my own. I asked some friends, hey, I'm looking to buy pot do you know anyone that I can buy this from and I had a really good friend at the time we're still friends but he told me that he knew a couple people so I started buying regularly and we started to hang out more because he really enjoyed smoking I was starting to enjoy smoking so that summer I spent most of it just smoking a lot of pot like sneaking off to the woods and smoking pot with this kid and I started experimenting with other stuff and I think my first introduction to opiates was uh, another kid's house who was selling acid acid at the time. I wouldn't try acid until way later on, but I went up to his house and he told me about DXM. And if you don't know what DXM is, it's an acronym for a very long chemical name, but it is it's closely re related to a uh, codeine. It's slightly different chemical wise, but it's very closely related to codeine. And he told me, yeah, you can get this shit like over the counter at these stores. You just have to steal it. Like you can get this shit at Walgreens. You can buy this shit in like pure powdered form online. And it's fucking crazy to me that you're able to buy this shit legally. But he put like some Robocough in like a cup with some fucking soda. I forget what it was. And he mixed it up and he said, here, try this. And I drank the whole thing. And that was the first time I had ever gotten a high off of opiates. And from then on, I was hooked. If you've ever tried codeine, it's very similar. It's just in higher doses of DXM, it can start to become a hallucinogenic. That is the biggest difference. And also with codeine, you get more of like a bubbly feeling, you know. But after that, I started to, on my own, go to stores and try to steal anything that had this chemical in it and see if I could abuse it. I tried Robocough. I tried drinking like two bottles of fucking NyQuil at a time. I tried taking like an entire, you know, those like Mucinex DM packets. I tried taking an entire one of those ones. It started to get really fucking rough. And I'm honestly surprised that my body still works the way it does. And I don't have like severe damage to my liver or to my stomach lining because I took this shit with reckless abandon and I didn't look at the different things that were in the stuff I was taking. I was only chasing after the high. I wasn't thinking about the negative effects that could come with overusing all this different shit that was in it, but I was a dumb kid, I guess. Uh, so junior year starts and this is where the story starts to take a darker turn. Um, I was actively abusing DXM again, and I somehow found myself in a relationship with this girl. And the thing is, it was the first time I think I had been in a relationship, and it was something that was completely new to me. Before I told you I was taking advantage of sexually, that was by two older girls, and with how my dad talked about being in different relationships, I had a very kind of skewed perspective on what a relationship looked like, and I was fucking clueless on what to do. All I knew was that this girl seemed to like me and accept me and I didn't want to lose that because I didn't want to lose the feeling that I belonged to someone that I belonged somewhere and I chose to be very emotionally abusive towards her because I didn't want to lose her 
and I'm not trying to use that as an excuse. Again, my actions were abhorrent, and I don't want to go into too much detail because it makes me fucking sick thinking about some of the things I said to her, some of the things that I tried to push onto her. But as you might have figured, the relationship eventually ended, and I was in denial at first, and then I eventually figured out, wow, I really fucked up, and I'm kind of a very terrible person. And the nine months that followed after that was the biggest bender I have ever been on. And mind you, at this time, I am 15, 16 years old. I tried a lot of different things during that time. I experimented with morphine. I experimented with codeine. I experimented with acid. I accidentally took meth one time. That was uh, interesting. I was trying to buy Molly, and apparently it was laced with meth, and I didn't know, but I guess I've tried meth, and that was during that time. That time for me is kind of a very big blur and I don't remember too much from it. All I can recall from that time is just certain snippets and flashes of things that happened. And sometimes I don't know if things have happened or haven't happened. Because I'll talk to my friends about that time and I'll be like, hey, do you remember when we did this? And they'll be like, I don't remember doing that. And they'll talk to me saying like, hey, you remember when we, when we did this? And I'm like, I don't remember that at all. And they're like, how could you forget that? And I'm like, I was, you know, fucked up probably. I, I can't remember it. And the thing about drugs use that people that are actively in addiction don't want to understand just because it allows them to stay in their delusion of if I take this drug it'll make me feel better but drinking to forget or taking pills to forget or smoking to forget something that you don't really want to remember never works because you're always going to be thinking about what you want to forget in that moment and you're only going to end up erasing the good memories that happened during that time while you're trying to forget you're going to get rid of the things that are going to happen happen naturally that are going to help you move on. You're going to forget about the friends that were there for you. You're going to forget about the people who said, hey, let's hang out. I'm tired of seeing you this down. You're going to forget about the support your family tried to give you because they see that you're fucking depressed and that you're crying all the time and that you're cutting your wrists because you just don't want to be alive at that point. It was April. April 11th of 2019. At that time, I wasn't depressed because like, oh, I lost the fucking love of my life or some stupid shit. No, I was depressed because I felt like I was a terrible person. I felt like a complete monster for what I had done, and I had trouble looking at myself in the mirror for a prolonged amount of time without wanting to look away or feeling sick from my own reflection. So April 11th of 2019, I decided to try to take my own life with a chemical overdose. So I went to the woods. I was with a friend. I didn't tell him what my intentions were, but he thought we were just going to smoke and have a good time. So we were doing that. We were smoking. He was smoking out of his pipe. I was smoking spliffs because that was my thing at the time. And I had this little baggie of pills with me. I had like some fucking DXM. I had some morphine in there. I had some other shit. It was all fucking opiates. And I started to take the pills like one at a time steadily. And he was kind of concerned asking me if I was okay to take all that. And I just kept telling him, hey, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. And you remember what I said earlier about if you take DXM in a high enough dose, it starts to become a hallucinogenic. I had the most, I don't want to say scarring, just fucked up trip I had ever had in my life. And I think it was partially due to the fact that I had ingested too much for my body to handle. Like, I thought I saw God. Like, the colors around me were fucking changing. The enclosure we were in was closing in. I was having a hard time breathing. I was on the floor crying, just screaming, just hoping someone would help me because I didn't know what was happening. I didn't realize the gravity of the decision I had made and what I had just done. Thank God someone did hear me. It was the track team from school and I was taken to the ER and conveniently enough the hospital was just across the street from my high school and the woods I was in was literally right next to the high school. <laughs> Again, it, it was a small town but I was there from I want to say 
4 p.m. until about maybe 12 at midnight or 1 in the morning until I find my body started to like, you know, metastasize and like I stopped freaking out in a sense. And I was hooked up to the IV. I was hooked up to all that shit they hook you up to if you have an overdose. It was fucking serious. And after that, I didn't quite know what to do. I remember going to my mom after that and just telling her mom I have a problem and I want help. So she signed me up to go to a rehabilitation facility and that didn't go quite well. I went there, was there for maybe a week, and it ended with me threatening to kill one of the staff members. Again, that action, I don't want you to think that I'm like a violent person because I'm not. I was coming down off of some harsh things and when you're coming down off of certain chemicals it changes the way you think and I just wasn't myself and there are so many things that I question why did I do that and I take full responsibility for it even though I realize that partially yes it does have to do with the drugs it was still me and that can mess with your head a lot but anyway I'm getting off topic so three police cars showed up and all three of them had their tasers drawn and pointed at me and I was loaded into the back of the cop car and I was bawling my eyes out because I was scared shitless and I was taken to a uh, psychiatric ward I don't know where it was all I know was that the rehab I was at was Nagura Hills after that I don't know where the hell we went it was might have been somewhere around there I honestly can't tell you but I went to a psychiatric ward and there were like two other kids in there and they had these like beds that you'd see in a prison they were like hard plastic the pillows themselves were also like fucking hard plastic it was awful there weren't any blankets it was very minimal and again it was something you'd see in like a prison cell and I was there for about three days thank god I wasn't there longer and I was transferred to a different mental hospital that had you know better accommodations um and i was there for i want to say a week and a half maybe two weeks while i was fully coming down off of you know the things i had been on and my violent tendencies started to go down and i was back to you know who i normally am which is i'm very non-confrontational and i don't like to fight people but after that i was transferred to a second rehabilitation facility in la phoenix house that was the name of it it was called phoenix house I was transferred there, and when I got there, most of the kids that were there were, like, on court order. They were gangbangers. Like, I had hung out with, like, gangbangers back at home, but I never was one. These kids were, like, hardened street kids, you know, and it was kind of sad to see. And all they could talk about was how much shit they were gonna do when they got out. Like, they were gonna fucking smoke the fattest blunt they'd ever- they'd ever smoked when they got out. They were gonna, like, party their asses off. They were gonna snort coke. They were gonna pop pills when they got out. They were gonna do all this shit. And that was all we ever talked about was like the drugs we were gonna do when we got out it wasn't a very you know healing or healthy environment for any of us so eventually i was there for like another two three weeks or something and i was discharged and i came back to school and you know i was getting a lot of shit for being like hauled off to like all these different facilities all these different kids were joking like yo look zach's out of prison and a lot of like mean-spirited stuff like people were just goofing on me for having like you know gone to all these places and you know it's high school I don't really put it past them I was kind of like the punching bag at the time but it didn't help I tried to reconnect to this girl that I had hurt but that didn't work out too well I just wanted to like kind of rekindle something that I died I guess but that was never going to happen because I'd already done the things I had done and there wasn't any taking that back there was nothing I could do then that could undo the things I had done and I had to learn that the hard way so I think during this time it was like a three month period when I was back home was like the most depressed I had ever been in my life. I wasn't taking opiates anymore because, you know, I didn't want to die. I didn't want to become someone I wasn't again. I didn't want to hurt anyone else. And also I didn't want to go through like the withdrawal effects, which is like violence, like violent tendencies. You're pissed off all the time. You have like the worst constipation like ever. It just isn't fun. I didn't want to go through any of that again. So mostly during that time, 
I was smoking a lot of pot. I was smoking cigarettes and I was using more LSD than I had been before just to kind of try to find myself, I guess, and try to atone for the shit that I had done in a weird way. I don't really know what I was doing at that time, but about three months of being back home, senior year of high school started and I uh, turned 17, like a day after my 17th birthday. I was waking up in my room at like two o'clock in the morning by these two guys that were there and they told me, Hey, let's go. We're gonna take you to a facility. And I wanted to fight it at first. Like, I was pissed off. I didn't want to go. But I went anyway, because what could I have done? And I was in that facility for about a little over a year, actually. That was the longest I had ever been in a, you know, rehabilitation facility. And at this place, you can look it up if you want. It's called a KW Legacy Ranch. It's like kind of a expensive, ritzy place. But, you know, my grandpa from Mexico paid for most of it not most of it like my grandma helped with that too like a whole family pitched in for it and it's like it was the first rehab facility where i actually started to see positive growth and started to like have a healthy environment to be in which really can tell you something about the rehab business industry because a lot of these places the relapse percentage is ridiculously high like you'll look at relapse probabilities of like 80 percent 90 percent 95 percent and it's insane and most of the time it's because these places don't promote healthy environments they just allow their tenants to do whatever they want and they're gonna stay in the same negative headspace and it's only gonna make them want to use more drugs and it isn't healthy at all it is something that is seriously wrong with the health industry it's seriously wrong with the medical industry among many other things and it's a hard thing to fix because you can't really enforce positive positivity that's the issue but you know i'm getting off topic again again this was the first place where i just started to see like good positive growth i started to work more on myself and the most powerful moment i had i think in my entire life was at that facility because i smiled for the first time in i want to say it might have been eight years i actually smiled again and god i'm trying not to tear up right now but at the time it i did cry because I was happy in that moment. I was actually happy and it wasn't because I was on a drug. It wasn't because I had someone there like an emotional like a partner with me or something. It's not like I had any other like thing there to help me. I was happy on my own. And that was the first time I realized that I don't necessarily need anyone else or anything else to be happy. I can be happy by myself. And that gave me back so much strength. It gave me back so much I had lost, and I can't thank the therapists and the staff members that work there enough, because I wouldn't be where I am right now without them. And I can't thank my family enough, because I don't know where the hell I'd be right now. So I was discharged from there about, you know, a little over a year later. I got my high school diploma there. I was able to get my accumulative GPA up from a 0.2 to a 3.6, and that's accumulative. I worked my ass off there, dude. It was rough, but I made it, and I got back home. Well, I didn't get back home because I decided I wanted to live with my grandparents, which I am right now because I'm currently in college. I'm going to community college. I am going into my second semester on the 18th at the time of recording. I believe it is the 10th. Yeah, and things are looking up. I reconnected with some old friends that also got sober around the same time I did and we do a lot of fun shit together. They're still in my old town, but they're like a two hour drive away from me. So we hang out when we can, when our work schedules all line up and we have days off. I met some new friends at my community college that I talk to regularly and I appreciate having them as friends. I'm doing a lot more positive things with my life now. I'm taking time to study. I'm getting good grades. Like last semester, I got a 4.0, which I haven't gotten since eighth grade. Just a lot of things are going right right now and a part of me thinks that you know things are bound to be go to shit again but i'm just doing my best to live in the moment and be happy with what i have and that brings me a lot of joy and i'm so grateful to be where i am right now and i'm grateful to be able to look at myself in the mirror again and realize that i'm not this monster that i saw myself as before i'm me
I have so many people to thank for that, but, you know, I'd be lying if I said that I still don't have trouble sleeping at night over some of the things I have done, but I can't change that. All I can change is how I act now and who I am as a person now. So that's my story, I guess. <laughs>